So uh, what we have next is uh, what we're titling our keynote. Uh, the whole day is really important, uh, but we felt that this particular session uh, kind of answered the major question that we were discussing amongst ourselves, which is it's been 10 years. Uh, has anything changed? Have, has Safecast had an effect uh, that we can we can tell as we look back? So I, I'm I'm really uh, very pleased. I wish I, I wish to be honest I could talk about this all the time. I wish I was always on it and doing it, but it's time to shut up and get out of the way. Um, so our host for this session is going to be uh, I'm very pleased to see it's Catronel Turkana. Uh, I I'm going to give uh, Catronel's introduction just so you, you you know a bit about her. She has a PhD and coordinates the program for integration of social and ethical aspects into nuclear research within the Belgian Nuclear Research Centre, SQSN. Uh, she has 25 years uh, experience research and training, nuclear emergency management, uh, notably decision support tools, public opinion, risk perception and behaviours and stakeholder engagement. Everything that we are talking about uh, and that we think about to do with Safecast and what's going on. Uh, she coordinated the Horizon 2020 concert Engage on enhancing stakeholder engagement in the radiology protection and led the, the work package in social aspects of uncertainty management for concert confidence and she chairs the IEA's MISTI project on integrated environmental management. Uh, I will leave uh, Katya now to introduce the rest of the panel who are equally as illustrious and have as much to say and with that uh, I may chip in a question or two from the sidelines uh, but I shall restrain myself but I, I'm really very much looking forward to this and, and, I, and I look forward to what you and the panel have to say. So over to you Katya now. Thank you very much Ian for this really great uh, introduction. Um, I'll just kindly ask you to put the spotlights on all the uh, panelists. So a warm uh, welcome to all those who follow the session via Zoom or YouTube. Um, over the next 50 minutes, we'll talk with a multidisciplinary group of researchers and professionals in the field of radiation protection and emergency management. And we'll be trying to trace with them the footprints of SafeCast over the last 10 years, uh, the marks its members have left on research policies and practices in emergency management, radiation protection, and disaster response. Uh, by having citizens generate independent, openly available, and actionable data on the radioactive pollution, SafeCast filled a gap of information and trust in the, in the aftermath of the Fukushima accident. And that's wonderfully illustrated by previous speakers, SafeCast volunteers in Japan and around the globe have since gathered a vast amount of radiation measurement data in more than 60 countries. Radiation prof protection professionals and organizations have reacted in different ways to SafeCast and other grassroots radiation monitoring initiatives, from enthusiasm and recognition in some cases to cautious engagement or opposition in other cases. And we've heard about uh, example of, of those uh, in the previous talks. What we'll discuss now is how the reception of an attitude towards SafeCast and other citizen science initiatives has changed over the years, how organizations do or should engage with citizen scientists, and how to bring recommendations regarding such engagement into practice. Where are we now and what is still needed? And indeed, there have been many recommendations, not least by European projects such as Eagle, Confidence, or Engage, or by international organizations and associations, encouraging formal uh, organizations such as public authorities and research centers to listen to citizens' needs, to engage with citizen scientists and explore new ways of collaboration. But how are these put into practice? What are the challenges and opportunities for collaborations? What are the pitfalls? These are some of the questions for our panelists. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce the four panelists. Uh, Tania Perko, she is a vice president of SHARE, the European Platform for Social Sciences and Humanities Research in Ionizing Radiation. She coordinated the European uh, project EAGLE, which tried to improve communication about ionizing radiation. Uh, she is a PA, she had, she's a social scientist with a PhD in risk perception and risk communication and currently a senior researcher at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, SCKCN and University of Antwerp. She is also the main organizer of the RECOMED conferences that we'll be hearing about it in a moment. The second panelist um, is Jan Hellebrand. He's a senior researcher in the emergency preparedness section of the Czech National Radiation Protection Institute in Prague. He specializes in GIS and the processing of mapping and measure data and, the visual, and their visualization. And he participates in QGIS plugin developments. 
Uh, our third panelist is Raf Kaiser, Professor of Nuclear Physics at the University of Glasgow and Managing Director of Linkios Technology, a startup company that uses cosmic ray muons to characterize radioactive waste containers. From 2010 to 2017, he was head of physics section at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And finally, last but not least, we have Astrid Leland. She's a nuclear chemist and director of the Emergency Preparedness and Response at the Norwegian Radiation and Nuclear Safety Authority. She has long experience in the long-term follow-up of the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. So let's talk. Uh, I'll uh, uh, give the word first a bit to each panelist, and then we'd like to have an as interactive as possible discussion. And please feel free to drop questions at any moment. I'll try to spot them. And otherwise, uh, I will be asking Jan to let me know when we have some interesting points that we need to address. Um, so Tanya, you have been the main organizer of the Recomet conferences and you have engaged with SafeCast from a very early on. Please tell us something about your experience and, uh, and uh, what you have observed throughout the years. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Katrinil, and thank you uh, to ASBI and to SafeCast for inviting me to this uh, nice event, which I follow from the early morning and congratulations for this. Um, it was in 2014 when I got, when I was coordinator of EGLE, uh, FP7 project, European Commission project, uh, with the name Enhancing Stakeholder Participation in the Governance of Radiological Risks for Improved Radiation Protection and Informed Decision Making. This project was supported by European Commission in order to improve communication and stakeholder engagement in new in, in ionizing radiation in general. And it was supported based on the Fukushima because the European uh, um, um, institutions, they recognize there is extremely low trust in the, in the authorities. Uh, there, is not, there is poor communication related to uh, ionizing radiation and something needs to be done because the world is changing, communication is changing and also institutions, they have to change. So we got this project and in 2000, uh, this project was, uh, we got it in 2013 and in 2014, I got a telephone call from Geneva who was just before participated in this uh, nice webinar. And she said, Tanya, we need to invite SafeCast. This is citizen science initiative from, from Japan. And they need to come there. This may be our solution for improved uh, stakeholder engagement and informed decision making. At this time, I, I, sorry, I really didn't know what citizen science is, although if I was a coordinator of European project. So uh, Geneviere, she was trying to describe and, and so on, but I must say I was also uh, quite, um, how to say, I, I had my limitations about this into understanding this, but we said, okay, let's invite these SafeCast people to come to our first conference, Recomet in 2015, and Let's see what do they have to say. So one interesting guy came from Tokyo, Asvi, and he inspired all of us. There was in the room was uh, 150 people, representative of civil organizations, journalists, authorities, international authorities. And uh, with his presentation, the discussion started. It was so interesting because he was really uh, he was really controversial and the discussions, they only, after his presentation, the discussion started and they continued during the breaks, during the evening, and they ended with a great party at the end. So this was the, the first meeting of the SafeCast and we continued our collaboration. We invited SafeCast to all Recomet conferences from 2015 on up till today. And uh, SafeCast people, uh, especially Asby Brown, they participated in these conferences. So the, the, our collaboration with the SafeCast started with the intention to improve public communication. So it was really limited to the communication. And then uh, in 2015, we encouraged ASBI to, and the uh, people from SafeCast to publish a scientific article because there was a lot of, um, uh, 
it was not such a huge understanding of what, what citizen science is. And we said, look, as we try to write a scientific article for the journal, uh, radiological protection journal, where you explain what this is also to the scientific community. We also uh, contributed the resources that this, pub, uh, this article was uh, is open source article. And up till now, it's extremely well quoted article. So uh, it was published. Um, with the title Safecast, Successful Citizen Science for Radiation Measurement and Communication, after Fukushima, written by Asby Brown, Peter Franken, Sean Bonner, Nick Dolezal, and Joe Moros. So uh, really fantastic uh, breakthrough into the scientific publications, uh, into the society. And then in 2016, we invited Asby to come to Europe again and to present Safecast to radiation protection platforms. So to present Safecast to uh, to the uh, Eurados, which is dosimetry radiation protection platform, to Alliance, to male Alliance is radio biology, to uh, low doses uh, uh, platform Melody, and so on. And he did again a great job. However, I noticed in the public that they were carefully listening, but they still didn't completely take it over. Huh? And uh, he got a lot of uh, unpleasant questions as well. And then uh, it was um, end of this project, Eagle. And in the, at the end of the, this project, in the, our recommendations, we wrote into recommendation 17, we wrote, we wrote that the, we, uh, we, we, we um, suggested to European authorities to go towards the Mutteler understanding through contribution to citizen science project by organizing, promoting, and supporting citizen science project, especially, for instance, related to sh with the sharing information and verifying the results. And then it continued as we came to the, in 2017, first time to the International Atomic Energy Agency, also with our support, with support of European Commission, and uh, immediately got another invitation in 2017, also at International Atomic Energy, also on international symposium on communicating nuclear and radiological emergencies to the public. And this conference, they brought together approximately 400 experts from 47 member states and 13 international organizations. And again, okay, it was conference about the communicating. It was not uh, communicating about ionizing radiation and risk, not about the research, which citizen science is, it's also a research. But however, this was some kind of breakthrough and then, uh, Immediately after this, we found the word safecast in many European projects, in Platenso, in Confidence, in Engage, in Opera, and in many others, uh, for instance, Shamisen Sync project, uh, where, where this project said that we should take that the, that the authorities, emergency and nuclear uh, emergency authorities, they should take steps to enable citizens to perform measurements and the support citizens to collect and share measurements data with authorities. So this was a huge step toward more, more informed um, society, but not only this, but contribution of citizens to the, to the scientific results. Uh, the main, uh, also uh, a project uh, supported by DG Energy uh, in 2019, recommends to collaborate with citizen science scientists pre uh, before emergencies in preparedness phase during the emergency and also after the during the recovery and this was based on the on the safe casts input uh, and then the main the the, the, the newest uh, result the newest footstep which is quite deep is the international irpa guide uh, IRPA is International Radiation Protection Association. They published in, two, uh, in 2020 practical guidance for engagement with the public on radiation and risk. And in Appendix 4, based on the safecast, it's a special appendix how to engage with uh, citizen scientists. So it's advice for the radiation, all the radiation protection associations, which they are worldwide 
to advise, they advise to, uh, they wrote experience has shown the such citizen science projects at Safecast will develop in various contexts, irrespective of any support from authorities or the radiation protection profession. It's therefore better for the profession to recognize this and to consider what role can we take to help bring these activities closer to our science community to make the activities more useful and scientifically based with the outcomes more meaningful for the public. So it's recognized as an opportunity, not only for communicating with publics, but also collaborating and contributing to radiation protection and also to scientific results. So uh, all together, I think that in this in this uh, sh short years, in 10 years, the SafeCast has a great uh, footprint, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And it has been taken up by different recommendations, different guidelines and different scientific publications. Thanks a lot, uh, Tanya. I think for the future, it will be very interesting to see how these ERPA guidelines are being transposed into practice and come back to the radiation protection societies to see some, some examples of, of how they engage with citizens in general and the citizen scientists in, in, in particular. So now let's turn to Jan, Jan Hellebrand. So uh, your organization has been uh, involved since a long time in citizen science projects. So um, I'm curious also to know what motivated you personally to, to get engaged with this. And I also believe that you have a, a couple of slides you would like to show us. Uh, yes, uh, I hope uh, everything uh, works now. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all, the, all the people visiting the, uh, this unit. Uh, I I started uh, I it, I discovered Safecast uh, because uh, as as my uh, as I am working for the emerg uh, emergency preparedness section in Prague uh, for the National Radiation Protection Institute, so we were uh, watching the Fukushima uh, situation really in detail, uh, and uh, soon we discovered. Uh, also safecast so uh, just just one slide to show you uh, where we are from from europe from czech republic uh, so uh, it's far from japan but uh, the people are very concerned about the situation and it's just our work uh, so uh, we we bought some big ideas something between 2014 and 15 and currently we have much much bigger fleet with something something like 50 or 60 big IDs. Uh, we uh, recently reached uh, more than 6000 big ID imports in the safecast api uh, and we have plenty of users uh, from from the public schools uh, kids students uh, because we are borrowing our big IDs uh, within the Ramesses project. Uh, we also have, uh, because of the big amount of the devices experience uh, related to servicing repairs, uh, we also have developed a complete processing workflow using the QGIS uh, software uh, and also performed several uh, testing in our laboratories. Uh, thanks to us, uh, also the tile map uh, can now uh, use Czech language. Uh, we also think that the education is really important. So uh, we prepared uh, plenty of materials, including the uh, so-called accompanying document for uh, traveling with big uh, Some We have a wiki for our users. Uh, we uh, published a lot of photos for public use and uh, also created uh, plenty of information graphics and so on. Uh, we, we also provide some uh, tips uh, for uh, traveling with big IE for, for trips, uh, some maps with uh, where you uh, can uh, measure something more than usual uh, national background. 
uh, we also uh, organized some field workshops uh, with students uh, and so on. Uh, this is a nice example of one of those nature anomalies uh, you can discover uh, just uh, in a common walking trip. Uh, and uh, recently, as there were some issues with related uh, the big IV manufacturing and distribution, uh, we also uh, are developing a new device called CheckRat, which should uh, gradually replace our big IVs as some of the devices are, uh, are dying. Uh, we hope it uh, might be uh, better in some uh, some ways uh, but uh, we are trying to keep it uh, as uh, as compatible as possible with uh, with the all safecast applications and uh, also with our uh, offline workflow using QGIS. so uh, we are not uh, going for uh, something completely different um, so i think that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you are interested, you can download this uh, presentation from this link. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan. I'm sure we will come back to you uh, on, on some of the points you mentioned. Uh, let's go now to Ralph Kaiser. Uh, Ralph, you participated uh, and even led multiple missions to Fukushima following the accident. Uh, so what was your experience with, with uh, SafeCast? Okay, so maybe I can give you a couple of um, observations and thoughts that I've had um, on citizen science in general and SafeCast in particular. Um, I was on multiple missions to Fukushima and I took the opportunity to also talk to locals in Fukushima when, when I could. And um, I got the impression that uh, their trust to the official authorities and the credibility of the information that was, uh, you know, given to them wasn't really all that great all the time. And one one message that I got was, uh, "You're from the IAEA. Uh, we're really happy that you're here." And uh, I had the impression that because we were an outsider in that case, um, that was seen as a good thing, and that we had maybe a bit more trust and credibility credit uh, than, you know, than some other, than some other uh, Japanese organizations that have had. And um, if, one, if one thinks about it, how one creates ultimately credibility and trust, then it's probably the best thing to let people participate themselves in the collection and in the analysis and in the distribution of the data. And that's exactly what SafeCast does. And um, I think that that's, a really, really important thing um, because credibility of the data and that the people believe that this is real and true is the only thing that then will also make them act on it. And, uh, and that's ultimately really important. Um, even one step further, just if I may generalize it a little bit, um, generally the collection and, and production uh, analysis and dissemination of data uh, has an important role to play in democracy. And uh, if one wants to have government by the people and for the people, then there should be an aspect of also access to the data, creation of the data and dissemination of data by the people, for the people. Um, I think that therefore citizen science like SafeCast uh, is making a really important contribution to democracy as such. Um, Maybe, maybe one, maybe one more observation. Um, I, I find that in today's world, uh, there's a little bit of a split between how much everything that we do is based on science and technology, and the attitude that we often find, um, at least in parts of the public, to science and technology. Science is is often seen as something that can only be done by scientists, and is far removed from the everyday sphere and in, in some respects that's probably really true not everybody can go and you know cook up a covid vaccine in their basement um it's probably a good thing that people don't try to do that um but but there are other areas uh for example amateur astronomers looking for comets 
um, where citizen science is playing a really important role. Like if you have a look at who found comets over the last 20 years, then a lot of them were found by amateur astronomers that, uh, that spent their time looking for comets. And SafeCast is like looking for comets, another excellent example where citizen scientists can do really good quality science and collect data that are valuable. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, have the public basically create their own data. Um, I find that really important. Um, another another observation that I that I'd like to talk about is how my students react. So I'm I'm, I'm teaching a course in nuclear power reactors at the University of Glasgow, and part of the course is also uh, radiation protection and environmental radiation measurements and uh, the accident in Fukushima, the aftermath of the accident, etc. And uh, every time I introduce SafeCast, um, the thing that surprises me most is the lack of surprise. So the students are not surprised. They find that this is something that is normal and probably should exist. And they expect that something like SafeCast should be there. And I believe that's because it syncs so perfectly uh, with their experience of uh, the digital world. Information is on my smartphone. That's where I find things. I find things on a website and uh, that I can feed things, that I can feed information in myself as well, which then ends up there and is available for everybody. Um, I, I really am every time surprised that the students are not surprised by this. They, they totally take this as a given. And, and the fact that they are taking it so much as a given is, uh, uh, is a great thing. It just shows that SafeCast naturally should exist. Thank you very much for this uh, reflection, Ralph. Uh, it's interesting the remark you made that there is a change in attitudes across generations with respect to uh, uh, citizen science. Um, we have some, we've had some comments from, uh, before going to Astrid, we've had some comments from ASB appreciating the extensive program of SURO and also from Jan uh, mentioning that OpenStreetMap is also uh, a project that started from something hobby made. Uh, so now uh, we come to Astrid. Um, Astrid, tell us something about your experience. In 2014, you have been uh, participating to the technical meeting of the IAA where SafeCast, uh, I think, first um, described their project and you were uh, quite enthusiastic supporters from the early start. So what was your experience? Thank you, Katrina. Well, I've been to Japan for a number of uh, missions and I've seen how important it is for people with data and also personal data, whether they have a personal dosimeter or they are offered whole body counting or they have somebody in the local community showing them measurement data and explaining to them what numbers means. And uh, when I heard about the SafeCast, I thought that it, it was uh, just a great idea both for the citizens themselves to increase uh, their trust. But I also, as um, being head of the uh, uh, emergency preparedness and response management in our inst uh, authority, I see how uh, this kind of big data coming from the public can add to the sort of scarce resources that you have in the authority. We are a limited number of people. We have a limited number of uh, equipments to to do the surveillance and I feel that uh, it's a good way of having more data coming in uh, in an accident situation so that you could faster see where you need to go to do more detailed official um, monitoring uh, to be able to uh, implement the right protective actions in a, in, in a post-accident situation and I find that it's very uh, interesting what Ralph was saying about that uh, data is important for democracy uh, and in Norway there has been for many years now uh, a very strong official demand that all data that are, are um, produced should be made available to the public and uh, you are not allowed to sort of uh, produce any data for public money and not uh, display it publicly for, for, uh, for everyone. So we are, of course, also working in uh, this manner. Uh, and the citizen science has not been used so, so far in Norway. 
uh, I think we will get there uh, as well. And uh, I, I certainly have an interest to, to see this develop also for us. But we see that uh, citizen science is being used, for instance, for air monitoring, for bird counting, for many types of environmental data, also for mental health uh, during this ongoing pandemic. So there is certainly an interest in the public to take part in this. And we will be part of a big European project on, uh, on uh, radon and norm, the radon norm project. And citizen science will be a component of that, where we'll be using uh, this um, uh, in a pilot project also in Norway. And moreover, I think that uh, what we see today is that there is a, an increasing distrust in science. There are a lot of fake news. And I think that if you bring people in so that they can actually uh, perform measurements themselves independent of authorities, that will increase the trust and then counteract this distrust that uh, we have, uh, that some people have in science. So I think it, it could be also good for democracy and uh, for people to be able to do their own measurements and, and to understand what it means and to use it independently of, of um, the authorities. Uh, and um, it's interesting to hear about when Ralph mentioned these amateurs, because amateurs are very appreciated in, in uh, many fields, but they are not in radiation. So you can ask why. I think that um, part of the radiation community has been very um, based on physics uh, and has been very conservative and that uh, they have had lots of views on only special people know really what it's all about and can say it accurately what it is. It is this and it's plus and minus one standard deviation. But in a real life situation with a huge fallout after a nuclear accident, that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to implement action swiftly to protect people and, and the environment. And in that sense, you can then use all of this big data together to have a more uh, sound basis for taking your decisions. And whether it's uh, 75 nanosieverts per hour or 105, that is exactly the same. The point is that it isn't um, 50 microsieverts per hour, you know. So uh, the use of this in a post-accident situation uh, is, as was pointed out, easier than to use this in low uh, dose rate areas in normal life, let's say. But you can use um, uh, this as part of educating the people and then seeing also what is uh, the normal background in areas and compare that to a new fallout situation when you are then suddenly... Um, overwhelmed, let's say, at the authority side for getting as much data in as possible. Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Astrid, for these reflections. So now uh, let's open the discussion with everybody, including uh, all those who are attending. Please feel free to pop your questions up and we'll be very happy to take them on. So um, coming back maybe to something that Tanya and other panelists have already mentioned. Um, they argue that there has been change, that uh, safe cast and citizen science has had an effect um, on institutions, associ professional associations and radiation protection communities. But do you think we are beyond recommendations? Um, I mean, do we need, is there, more need to put this into practice? How, what, what do you think if something happened now, would things be different than if they were 10 years ago? So what do you think? Mm, I, I think so. I think one should give Safecast a lot of credit for uh, actually making it into things like uh, EARPA reports and IAEA technical meetings. Uh, those are actually two really conservative organizations uh, they don't just let anybody walk in, uh, and, and it is a process to actually be recognized and get in there that usually does take years. And it is a lot of, to the credit of SafeCast, that SafeCast is being recognized there, invited to meetings, speaking at meetings, and mentioned in reports. Anya, you wanted to intervene? Yes, uh, I completely agree with Ralph, but I would also like to add that uh, in, if I look from communication point of view, 
uh, one of the most difficult thing is to communicate measures below the legal norms or the natural background and so on. And now with the safe cast measurements in Europe, we have these natural background measurements. And if something would happen, people can go to these measurements, although if we have also official measurements, huh, they can also cross check with the safe cast measurements and see what is the natural background and if there is something really going on. So this comparison before, during and after, it's extremely helpful and it is now here available, which was not before. And then moreover, I would like to, um, I would like to bring into attention also that uh, Safecast didn't open only a path forward for the nuclear and radiological emergencies, but in general for all radiation protection. For instance, like Astrid mentioned, uh, radon. This is also one of uh, great opportunities for the citizens or, or norm contaminations for the citizens to, to, to measure the radioactivity in the environment, in their homes or in their, uh, in their vicinity. And uh, this is going on. I must say that in the one European project, this uh, Radonorm project, we evaluated uh, the existence of citizen science project in the field of radon. And we identified, based on these 10 principles of, of uh, European Citizen Science Association, we identified nine, nine uh, projects in the worldwide that are already could be seen as a citizen science projects and where people measure uh, uh, radiation due to, the, due to the radon. Two of these nine projects, they existed already before Safecasts. And uh, the rest of these projects, uh, they appeared after Safecast became really well known, and they also refer quite often to the to the Safecasts as the as the project uh, where people citizens can measure radioactivity. So yes, of course, the things are changing, and they changed a lot since we have Safecast, and also, of course, since Fukushima happened. So we can be a bit optimistic about that then. Um, and Jan, uh, you are also involved in some activities with citizens measuring uh, uh, radiation. You have an interesting term, you call it radio catching. Can you tell us something about this? Uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, based uh, on the map I showed uh, on one of the slides. Uh, I am uh, uh, I prepared some data uh, with positions on uh, uranium mining sites, which uh, might be uh, possible to uh, visit. Uh, some of them are after remediation, so uh, they are safe for the public to visit. And there are no, no holes to fall in and so. Uh, but you can measure uh, some higher uh, dose rates there. Uh, same with uh, some uh, some big granite rocks uh, and some parts. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, I I think ma many people from the public f found this interesting uh, to uh, if they find some new new anomaly in the, in nature, uh, they often uh, inform us uh, about it and. Uh, as as it uh, appears on the safecast map, uh, often new uh, new measurements uh, um, happen in a close time later, as uh, other users uh, find this anomaly on the map and decide to visit it too. So. Okay, thank you, Jan. We have a question to Astrid from Genevieve. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, she asks, what could be a good uh, organization with Safecast? What could be a good way to organize, uh, uh, I guess, emergency response uh, together with Safecast? If uh, an accident occurs in Europe, how to coordinate the measurements, uh, the measurement organization with Safecast or Suro tools? Do you have some thoughts on that? 
um, <laughs> I don't really know how that uh, can be done as we see it now. Um, I, I found it interesting to see how the DOE aerial survey data was used also in the safe cars. Uh, if we think about Europe and, uh, and uh, monitoring data, we have, of course, the EURDEP, which is the European Commission data set for radiation monitoring. It's used in peacetime for all the stationary radiation stations that we have in Norway today and also for air filter data. Uh, but I'm not sure how um, this will be if we have a large accident uh, that uh, has uh, fallout in many European countries, uh, how safe cars and the official data will be used together. Um, I mean, uh, to pool all the data in one place, let's say. So it's, and I'm not sure if that will be necessary either, that maybe uh, it's, it could be an advantage that safe cast data um, are, uh, uh, that the safe cast data only contain sort of citizen data and that the public data are, um, uh, are posted by the different authorities because then people themselves can see, you know, what is um, the official data and what are the, all the other measurements that have been done and, and do, do they match and can we then trust, you know, uh, what the gov uh, governmental data shows. And I was thinking also about uh, this, um, uh, this great work that Zero is doing. Um, and I, I actually have one question and- um, Go ahead. It, it, um, you are now producing your own devices that you will distribute to the public. Um, do you think the public uh, in an accident situation, let's say, will trust the measurements from your sort of official uh, devices as much as devices coming from an NGO? Ian, would you like to take this question? Uh, your microphone is mute. I, yeah, uh, I, um, um, so, so, so okay, I, uh, uh, I, I would leave it, uh, um, yeah, there is, uh, I think there is, there is, uh, uh, an area uh, which uh, should be kept for the professionals and uh, uh, another for the citizens, because uh, as uh, uh, yeah, there are some some things the citizens uh, probably would not like to uh, decide, uh, but uh, there is definitely the good thing with the possibility to cross check the data to see it's. Uh, similar uh, to the official ones uh, and so but uh, uh, if if we if we need uh, advice uh, we, pro uh, we should usually uh, ask some professional about it no matter which sort of uh, uh, area is that uh, if it is uh, medicine uh, radiation anything Okay, thank you for your uh, response, Jan. Um, there was a comment related to the radiation background mentioning the EURDEP system. Of course, countries have such networks in place, but we know that the resolution, I mean, the number of stations in different countries varies. Some countries have a very dense monitoring networks, other less so. Uh, Tanya, would you like to? Yes, of course, I, I, uh, we, we know this. And uh, especially in uh, Belgium, we have a Telerad system, which is really great. and it's publicly uh, accessed uh, information online, but uh, in, uh, from psychological point of view and sociological point of view, we people, we cross check different sources of information. And if you have official source of information and then citizen science source of information, and both of them, they say the same, then you believe much more and you act according to the, to the advices that they are complementary to each other. Thank you. Um, Raph, um, yes, think, you wanted to... Yeah, I'd, I'd like to project a little bit into the future. So if one, if one looks at what the actual current impact right now is on official policy, 
then it's really just in the beginnings. I mean, as I said before, the SafeCast is there and SafeCast is recognized, but really uh, this is a big super tanker that is moving slowly. And uh, mostly radiation protection is done by radiation protection professionals. And uh, anything that comes in in addition is, is taken up slowly. However, if one projects it a bit into the future, and if one assumes that the number of sensors keeps increasing and there's more and more data being produced in the future, then at, at some point, um, quantity is a quality of its own. If there's more data there that, that can be had by accessing uh, you know, publicly created data through citizen science, then the data that is created by uh, radiation protection agencies themselves um, they'll have to go there and use the data. It's really a matter of also how much is there and, uh, and, and can it be used. Uh, and let me give you an example of, um, you know, slightly related, but, but a bit different. Um, after the accident in Fukushima happened, uh, the official website of the IAA became inaccessible because too many people were, were going and wanting to look up information. And uh, the then head of public relations of the agency went and put the information on Facebook. And on Facebook, uh, the IAEA page on Facebook kept uh, remained accessible all the way along. And, uh, and it, the traffic was a few percent of overall Facebook traffic. And uh, for me, that's a nice illustration that really quantity is a quality of its own. And if there is a lot, then, then that's where one will move. Anya, you wanted to react as well? Yes, I would like to uh, upgrade something what Ralph already said. In the future, uh, I would like to encourage uh, also citizen science initiatives like SafeCast as well, to also to contribute to science, not only to use the citizens as a, uh, crowdsourcing or maybe also interpretation of the results and understanding of the results, but also really to connect to the to the research organizations and contribute to the to the research questions. This would be really great also in the future, and it, I think it would help also for recognition of the of their work and uh, recognition of uh, and validation of their uh, of the results of the citizen scientists you're mute catch it out yeah we have a big storm in belgium so i've just heard the big thunder so i muted myself um so uh, as we was pointing out and several other people pointed out the importance of informal contacts um so when, when is there a time to switch from informal to formal and to have clear guidelines for the inclusion of, of uh, citizen science data in emergency response? So what's your thought on that? Maybe uh, Astrid or uh, Jan would like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to add uh, also one thing uh, which I uh, find great that the huge uh, safecast data set uh, also made it possible uh, many, many student projects to happen. As, as I know, there were no such data available before. So uh, it can, uh, as, as, it, uh, as the data are uh, spatial with uh, some time in uh, date interval, uh, time date information, it can be used for um, many uh, many GIS visualization and web projects, uh, and uh, I am also using it a lot uh, when we cooperate with the students. As the, uh, as I always uh, take some part of the Safecast dataset and provide it to the students to let's say play with it. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Astrid, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think that uh, we will certainly be uh, investigating more about how we can uh, work with the citizen science and, and, and safe in the safe cast system uh, if we have a new emergency. So this is certainly something that we will look into in the coming years. Um, 
you can never have enough data, <laughs> usually, uh, and the, the authorities uh, do not have enough equipment and resources uh, to to map every single uh, street uh, in in Norway. Although we have, of course, aerial monitoring, which can take larger parts, but then there's much coarser data. So I think that uh, for the reassurance of the public, uh, it will be important that they have measurement data from their own street, from their own garden, etc. Uh, or at least someone in their neighborhood. So, um, and we know that also from the Chernobyl accident that people uh, were very uh, keen on getting uh, local data. That was the most important thing for them. So uh, we will certainly look into how uh, Safecast uh, and uh, uh, and the authorities can, you know, benefit from each other uh, if there's a new accident. Uh, thank you. Yes, Arap. I think there's an additional angle here um, where developing countries are concerned. Um, so if you have a country like, let's say, Belgium, for example, where there is a radiation protection monitoring network, uh, the data are publicly available, and then you're adding some privately generated citizen science data, um, they're not really filling a gap. They're, they're additional, they, they lend additional credibility, but there isn't really a clear need where there wasn't something before. It's, it, it already is being monitored. Um, but I remember, for example, a conversation uh, with, with a colleague in Nepal uh, who, after the Fukushima accident, got a phone call from his prime minister. And the prime minister said, OK, so are we in danger in Nepal? And he said, well, actually, we don't have a detector. We can't tell you. And at that moment in time, that really literally in, in Nepal was no way to measure environmental radioactivity. And that is a country that borders only on nuclear powers. Uh, so, you know, Pakistan, India, China. Uh, so they did not have those means. And uh, if you've seen, uh, I was really happy to see Akmal half an hour ago or an hour ago, uh, who was talking about his project in, in Uzbekistan. Um, I, I think, uh, I think Safecast can actually help fill gaps uh, in countries where the cost of equipment and setting up a you know stationary monitoring network uh, is not an option, um, but having people be able to monitor things and feed them in themselves uh, is also a low cost option that replaces nothing. There was nothing before, and then there's information after, and that's a big qualitative difference. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Jan, you would like to also react? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it was a great point uh, by Ralph. Uh, we did some uh, some tries with uh, taxi drivers uh, and with the VGID. So we proved that uh, the we do not need uh, experience users for the Safecast uh, devices. So uh, we can, in in such case, use uh, after some short short advice some common people uh, that could be especially for the, for the developed countries uh, important as uh, we can send a guy on, on the motorcycle or some taxi driver to do the monitoring and uh, then uh, at some point just pick up the devices and pro process the data. So I think this is also great as you do not need uh, some uh, radiation uh, specialists for doing uh, doing the monitoring. Um, thank you, Jan. There was a, also another question for you that in the case of an accident, how would you imagine the distribution of the tools you have developed? Uh, which uh, which tools? Uh... Uh, so the question was, how does Suro imagine the distribution of the tools you are developing for uh, citizen science? if there was an accident near the Czech Republic? Uh, we have already some cooperation uh, with the uh, emergency system, with the firefighters uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, so uh, this, this could be done uh, with them. Uh, we have some of the firefighters has stations uh, across the whole country uh, so they could uh, manage the monitoring and uh, they are also uh, 
we also uh, had uh, some other cooperation with the other parts for uh, of the first responders uh, in, in this country. Okay, thank you. Um, your colleague uh, Peter Kucha uh, was making the remark that the devices should be distributed before the, any incident. Well, this is, yes, uh, always a, a matter of discussion, I suppose. Um, we have five minutes to wrap up. Yes, Ralph, please. I think we should be clear that if there's actually an accident, nobody's going to say walk towards the accident and take some data, right? That's, that's not what anybody's going to do. Uh, if you have a device that measures data, then leave it somewhere where it can take data and, you know, stay inside and don't go out if there's an accident. Okay, so... Katrina, can, can, I, can I be cheeky yes. and exercise a, a little yes. bit of privilege? In, I, so yes. I'm terribly sorry, I'm not going to sneak in to ask the question I want to ask. So uh, I've been following this, you know, avidly and really interesting in the... We've set this section up looking back, you know, have, have SafeCast influenced it. I'd just like to ask the panel's opinion to turn around slightly. I want to pose the question, can, can governments, can officialdom ignore say, this anymore? The reality was that SafeCast came into existence because it needed to. I, we've just lived through 2020 uh, in, the, in the COVID years. There's a plethora of information and the population has shown that it will do what it wants to do do you think the point will come where if something happens, the trusted data source is not going to be the government. It's going to be uh, the citizen science and the government are actually going to have to turn, the boot's going to be on the other foot. They're going to need to persuade the citizen scientists to follow the policy rather than telling the citizens that they have to follow the policy because they say so. Right? I, I think if the last year's taught me anything, it's like, it's, they only get locked down when everybody understands and agrees. And, I, and I, I would like to have the panels feel for whether we're kind of phrasing this wrong and actually the power let lies somewhere else, they just might not realize it. So let's uh, hear our panelists' opinion. Tanya, would you like to start? Yes, uh, I would like to say that citizen science, like, also safe cast, of course, they contribute to credibility and trust, like it was pointed just right now by Jan. And uh, in every nuclear or radiological emergencies, either with the radiological consequences or no radiological consequences, there is many voices, many opinions, many views and many standpoints. And uh, citizen scientists are one of those voices and they got, are more and more heard. For instance, ruthenium case uh, two years ago, increased of ruthenium in Europe. Uh, of course, uh, uh, safety, uh, nuclear safety authorities, they voiced their opinion with a bit of delay because they need to cross check and they need to get an approval from the, all the hierarchy and so on. While citizens, they also voiced their uh, opinion uh, on this increased uh, ruthenium in the in the northern hemisphere, and uh, they were they were much faster, and their voice was heard much much more. For instance, Safecast published a blog that was uh, how to say studied by the European Commission. I must say they wanted to know what Safecast said and what is the position of the Safecast. So it okay. is, uh, Safecast became a recognized voice in the public and also authorities, they started to take into account the voice of citizen scientists. Yes, the scientists and the authorities, they have more measurements, they are more scientific, they are better, they are, I don't know what, but still the citizen scientists networks, they, they can have, they can first express their opinion much faster. And uh, uh, second, they are, they, they contribute to credibility and trustworthiness. So the future is collaborate together, learn from each other, listen to each other and exchange. That, that would be my advice. Thanks, Tanya. <laughs> I think this summarizes pretty well uh, the discussion. Anybody else would like to uh, comment shortly on this? Yeah. Raf, think, shortly, yeah. Shortly, quickly, we're all from countries where by and large our government generally can believe most of the time on most things. Uh, Western style democracies make up about a quarter of the countries in the world. That means that for actually the larger part of humanity, 
trusting their governments is maybe not always the normal thing that they do. And uh, knowledge by the people for the people is an important part of uh, freedom, government by the people for the people, democracy, all of those things. And uh, citizen science like Safecast can, can play a small role, but an important role in that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ian or Astrid, would you like to uh, give your thoughts very shortly on this? Uh, I think uh, that uh, ignoring safe costs or other uh, citizen sign projects uh, would be um, stupid, really. Uh, we know that people are very digital. They are searching, searching information everywhere. Uh, there are uh, different ways of using, using your mobile phone for measuring radiation, which is much poorer than the safe cost instruments that people believe in. Uh, so we need to uh, remember what, what was said about how students are not surprised that there is such a thing as safe cost. And we need to know that these are the young people growing up uh, and uh, they expect something different than old, uh, than, you know, us the old uh, natural scientists. Uh, so uh, we need to incorporate that. I mean, the, the world is changing. People's uh, expectations are changing and we just have to follow up on that. Yeah. Thank you, Astrid. Jan, did you want to say anything else? Else will, yes? I, I think the most important points uh, were already said here. So Okay, so we'll maybe end with this positive message that the future is collaboration. And I'd like to thank very much uh, our uh, panelists, uh, also all the people behind the screens, um, Ian and uh, Luis and Mericha, who have helped with the technical organization, of course, also Asby and, and uh, Peter. And I'd like to thank uh, all, the pen all the attendees uh, via Zoom or via the YouTube. And I think uh, we can move forward to the next exciting events uh, planned. Excellent, which is going to be a video. Thank <laughs> you, Mary. Hello, dear Safecasters. Happy 10th anniversary. My name is Mirjana Cioic. I am a researcher at the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences, University of Belgrade in Serbia. In 2017, I had opportunity to attend the workshop in the field of environmental mapping in the International Center for Theoretical Physics in uh, Trieste, Italy. There I met uh, wonderful people all around the globe and I uh, built uh, my uh, first B uh, device. Uh, since then, I don't know how many uh, records I made. And uh, I remember that at the beginning, I carried uh, my uh, device everywhere I go. Uh, for me, it was interesting uh, to compare radiation dose rates uh, arising from soil uh, radiation uh, measured uh, in the laboratory with uh, the Kaigi recorded uh, dose rates. Also, I remember uh, the first time I was traveled by plane taking uh, the Kaigi with me. It was very exciting uh, to observe uh, changes in radiation measurements with the change in uh, altitude. In the collaboration with my colleagues from the University of Novi Sad, Department of Physics, and via Observatory of the University of Seged, vertical ionization profile was measured using Big IG Nano lifted by meteorological balloon. In those measurements was registered anomaly in the atmospheric ionizing radiation in a very narrow altitude region and I hope that those results will be published soon. Personally, I think that citizen science can uh, serve as a pool of knowledge if it is interpreting properly. Wish you all the best, share your findings. Knowledge is unlimited and it belongs to everyone. Good luck. <laughs>